Hello students, I am Tulika Banerjee. Today I bring you the next learning episode in BSc Forensic Science on an important unit of paper that is Forensic Psychology that is Juvenile Delinquency. Dear students, in the introductory module, you will get to know about what exactly is meant by the term juvenile delinquency and how crimes are committed by children. After you have acquainted yourself with the term juvenile delinquency, you will be told about the factors related to psychology of juvenile offenders. In addition to it, you will also be told about juvenile sex offenders and the laws against juvenile delinquency. In this lecture, you will also be told about child abuse and the laws related to it. We will wind up this lecture with the conclusion. So, dear students, let us have a look at the modules which we are going to learn today. Module 1 is regarding introduction to juvenile delinquency. Module 2 is regarding factors related to psychology of juvenile offenders. Module 3 is regarding juvenile sex offenders. Module 4th is regarding laws against juvenile delinquency. Module 5th is regarding child abuse and the last module that is module number 6th is of conclusion. The issue of human violence is also a major topic within the academic discipline of psychology. As biosocial theorists do, psychologists focus on how individual characteristics may interact with the social environment to produce a violent event. However, rather than focus on the biological basis of crime, psychologists focus on how mental processes impact individual propensities for violence. The youth of today are faced with a variety of problems that put them at risk. These problems include underage drinking and driving, drug abuse, pregnancy, suicide, truancy, gang activity and prostitution. It is not uncommon to pick up a newspaper on any day and find an article describing such behaviors. Crime by juveniles is a harsh reality in India. In recent times, juveniles were found to be involved in most heinous of the crimes such as murder and gang rape. It is a disturbing trend and society as a whole is anguished by such criminal acts by children. Police involvement in the lives of juveniles has varied considerably throughout the history. The general approach to youthful offenders within the justice system has been largely rehabilitative rather than punitive. Juvenile offenders are believed to be more malleable to behavior change than adults, giving their vulnerable development stage. In other words, there is greater hope that these offenders, whose early criminal career is more easily disrupted, will become productive members of society. So, let us concentrate upon what exactly is meant by the term juvenile delinquency. Juvenile delinquency is frequently used to describe behavior that is a violation of criminal law, but that is committed by individuals who have not yet become adults. The nature of juvenile offenses is varied and can include anything from status offenses to murder. Moreover, the public's view of these crimes often contrast with the realities. Overall, there are about 2 million juvenile arrests each year, 1 million are sent to juvenile court, about 5 lakh are admitted to detention centers and about 10,000 of these juveniles are sent to criminal court for further adjudication as stated by Shoemaker and Wolf in the year 2002. About 61 percent of juvenile proceedings are delinquency proceedings. 19% for status offences and 19% for victimization or abuse of children as stated by Ostrom, Coder and La Fountaine in the year 2001. Research indicates that a distressing number of juvenile offenders are younger and that more juvenile cases are being sent to adult courts 
as stated by Sigmund in the year 1994. Another significant area of juvenile delinquency is the commission of property crime. Property crimes typically include offences like burglary, theft and arson. About one third of all juvenile arrests are for a property related crime as stated by Godwin and Helms in the year 2002. Burglary is often characterized by entering a structure of some kind and unlawfully stealing property on those premises. Theft is defined as the unlawful taking or possession of property and differs from burglary in that the former entails an offender stealing while in or around a property legally. Theft would generally include crimes such as shoplifting, pickpocketing or purse snatching. Finally, Arson is often considered a property crime but also can be considered a violent crime because of the potential harm to other persons. Arson is the burning of property and may be committed for monetary gain or for the sheer enjoyment of the act. Property crimes have been decreasing over the last 30 years as stated by Puzenshera Estra All in the year 2012. A substantial research base now exists that better identifies some of the casual pathways for juvenile delinquency, as stated by Moffat in the year 1993 and 2006. Typically, the risk factors for juvenile delinquency are derived from several major areas and reflect the developmental nature of juvenile delinquency compared to the adult antisocial behavior. The individual family, school, peers and the neighborhood all contain risk factors relevant to juvenile delinquency as stated by Redding, Goldstein and Hilbron in the year 2005. Substance abuse, mental health concerns, general impulsivity and difficulties in problem solving are important individual risk factors. Many argue that many of the problems with juvenile delinquency arise from the family context. For example, poor parental attachment, a lack of parental supervision and harsh or generally ineffective discipline are the most significant familial risk factors. School is also a significant area of concern for juvenile delinquency. Academic difficulty, unrecognized learning disabilities poor school attendance and general academic dissatisfaction are all risk factors for juvenile delinquency. Delinquent peers and gang membership are also potential concerns related to juvenile delinquency. Exposure to violence, drug dealing and access to firearms are neighborhood risk factors as stated by Reading Extra All in the year 2005. Cottle etc. all in the year 2001 conducted a meta-analysis examining the most significant risk factors related to general recidivism among juveniles. They organized 30 different possible factors into 8 categories that is demographic information, offense history, family and social factors, educational factors, intellectual and achievement factors, substance use history, clinical factors and formal risk assessment. Cottle etc. all in the year 2001 found that demographic factors such as being male of a minority race and from a low socio-economic level were all associated with juvenile recidivism. Race was not a significant predictor once socio-economic status was controlled for in the analysis. This finding is typical across recidivism studies no matter the form of crime or violence predicted. Although race is often associated with higher risk for reoffending, it appears that general finding is related to the lower socio-economic status of minority individuals in the United States and not to their racial identity. 
offense history, variables were the biggest predictors of recidivism, including factors such as a younger age at first legal contact, younger age of first juvenile commitment, number of prior arrest, number of prior commitments, commitment of more serious crimes and a longer first incarceration. All the offender history, family and social factors were the most consistent categories of predictors. There also were a number of dynamic predictors that were related to general recidivism. Factors like family instability, association with delinquent peers, poor use of leisure time, conduct problems, non-severe pathologies, poor achievement scores on a standardized test and substance use were all predictive of recidivism and also can be directly targeted for intervention. At least one study has suggested that it may be more appropriate to use different risk factors for different types of juvenile offenders though. As stated by Mulder, Vermont, Brand, Bullens and Juan Marley in the year 2012. One factor that has had mixed success is the presence of pro-social peers. Although delinquent peers have been consistently associated with delinquent behavior, the evidence has not been as clear if a juvenile actually has positive peers surrounding him as stated in DHHS 2001. About 19% of forcible rapes are committed by male perpetrators under the age of 19 and about one third of child molesters are juveniles. As stated by Finkelhor, Omrod and Schaffen in the year 2009. Thus, the system has recognized that juveniles account for a significant percentage of the sexual crimes. In a study examining two different samples of juvenile sex offenders, one group of sex offenders in a specialized intensive treatment program for sexual offenders and sexual offenders from a less intense program of general offenders were compared 10 years after release. Both groups were more likely to be re-arrested for a non-sexual offence. About 31% for the specialised treatment group and 47% for those from the general offender population than a sexual offence of less than 5%. Furthermore, those offenders from the specialised sexual offender treatment programme took longer to re-offend for all offence types compared to the group of juvenile sexual offenders from the general offender program. Weight etc. all in the year 2005 also found that impulsive or antisocial behaviors were significantly related to reoffending. Hilburn etc. all in the year 2005 conducted a preliminary study on the available studies examining juvenile sex offenders and the risk factors related to reoffending. They discovered four significant risk factors for reoffending among juvenile sex offenders. Being an acquaintance of the victim was the most significant predictor of reoffense, followed by not receiving any form of treatment, a less severe initial offense, and being a younger offender. Juvenile sex offenders who victimized acquaintances rather than strangers or friends were more likely to reoffend. Juveniles who had received treatment were less likely to reoffend. One potentially counterintuitive result was that juvenile sex offenders who committed less severe initial offenses were more likely to reoffend, possibly suggesting a tendency to escalate in the severity of their offence history. The younger the offender, the more likely he or she was also to re-offend. One question remains though, do these offenders really differ from counterparts who perpetrate non 
sexual violence. One study that focused on juvenile sex offenders compared 122 male and 61 female juvenile sex offenders as stated by Vandiver and Teske in the year 2006. Female offenders were younger at the time of arrest, had younger victims, were likely to receive shorter sentences as compared to the male offenders and were perpetrated on girls and boys proportionately. Male juvenile sex offenders were more likely to victimize girls. These early results may suggest that female juvenile sex offenders are not identical to their male counterparts and may have different risk factors for initially offending or re-offending. The Government of India enacted the Juvenile Justice Act in 1986. In 1989, the UN General Assembly adopted the Convention on the Rights of a Child, which was ratified in the year 1992 by India. The Convention outlines the process and the need of reintegration, the right of the child without judicial proceedings were avoidable. Hence, for fulfilling the standards of the convention, the government felt a need to amend the law. In pursuance of this, in 2000, the Juvenile Justice, Care and Protection of Children Act took the place of the old law. The act provides for a much sensitive special approach towards the treatment and prevention of juvenile delinquency. It provides a framework for the treatment protection and rehabilitation of children in the purview of the juvenile justice system. This act has been further amended in 2006 and then later on in 2010. According to the sections 82 and 83 of the IPC which is Indian Penal Code, a child who commits a crime and is below the age of 7 is not considered to have committed a crime. A child who is between the ages of 7 and 12 and is deemed to have immature understanding about the consequences of his or her actions is also considered incapable of committing a crime. Since ages, children have been victimized by one abuse or the other. It is not wrong to say that they are a lot neglected. Throughout the history of our society, children have been bought, sold, enslaved, exploited and killed. They have been abandoned, severely beaten and physically abused. In fact, the more we go in history, we can find that a lot of children had been hushes and crueler. Sexually abusive behavior of a child is described as behavior under which a person under 18 years tends to physically indulge with another person without his or her consent. This may be due to multiple reasons such as aggression, exploitation, manipulation and for threatening purpose. It is critically important to use the correct terminology according to the type of sex crime committed such as molester, perpetrator, predator etc. Such terms are linked to the group irrespective of his or her age, cognitive abilities, diagnosis or the developmental stage. According to data available, it is found that about 30 to 60 percent of all child sexual abuse cases are linked to juveniles. Since these days, children are exposed to sexual content everywhere, whether it is television, internet or other sources. This large amount of sexual information leads to confusion and incongruous behavior. Adolescents are exposed to sexual images on television, through popular songs, in movies and through video games. This flood of sexual information can lead to confusion and in an inappropriate behavior. According to the data, sex offenses are committed mainly by the age group of 12 to 14 years as early teenage is the peak time for offences against minors. A very small number of offenders belong to age group less than 12, whereas only 7% of sex crimes are committed by females. 
Some child abuse cases involve child molestation, which occurs when a person has sexual contact with young children who are not mature enough to give consent. Juveniles may commit crime of child molestation. The level of crime depends on the age of the criminal. Rape of a child takes place when sexual intercourse is forcibly done with another person who is too young to give consent for it. Sexual intercourse includes penetration of any type irrespective of the depth of penetration. When someone views photographs or films another person's personal or intimate areas, it is known as voyeurism. Some children are also involved in this illegal activity. Sometimes when someone sends a sexually explicit image of minor through text message is termed as sexting. These types of messages are considered as sex offences and the juvenile is registered as sex offender. As already discussed, generally the offences committed against children or the crimes in which children are the victims are considered as crime against children. IPC and the various protective and preventive special and local laws specifically mentions the offences wherein children are victims. The age of child varies as per the definition given in the concerned acts and sections, but age of child has been defined to be below 18 years as per the Juvenile Justice Care and Protection of Children Act 2000. Therefore, an offence committed on a victim under the age of 18 years is construed as crime against children. The youth of today are faced with a variety of problems that put them at risk. These problems include underage drinking and driving, drug abuse, pregnancy, suicide, truancy, gang activity and prostitution. Crime by juveniles is a harsh reality in India. In recent times, juveniles were found to be involved in most heinous of the crimes such as murder and gang rape. It is a disturbing trend and society as a whole is anguished by such criminal acts by children. The offences committed against children or the crimes in which children are the victims are considered as crime against children. IPC and the various protective and preventive special and local laws specifically mentions the offences wherein children are victims. Dear students, this is the end of our conclusion module in which we have recapitulated our chapter about juvenile delinquency. I hope you all have enjoyed this lecture. I hope you all have understood the underlying concepts of this chapter. Do keep in mind what we discussed today. I will be back with one more lecture in this series. If you want to learn more and enhance your knowledge, you may log on to our website www.cec.nic.in for MCQ, quizzes, LWARDs, etc. Make sure you revise the modules frequently so that you master the topic well and take up the exercises. Thank you for your time today. I will see you in the next lecture. Keep learning and goodbye.